like to call the meeting to order. And if you'll please rise, we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance together. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <laughs> and would you please call the roll? Uh, Mr. Thompson? Yes. Mrs. Fiesel? Yes. Mrs. Rigolo Dye? Yes. Mrs. Getsman? Yes. And Dr. Bennett? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for filling in for our treasure. Thank you. Sick this evening. <laughs> um, I would entertain uh, a motion to approve the minutes from the September 15th regular meet, special meeting and the September 17th regular. Right. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Gould. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Second. Oh. Were there any corrections? Um, okay. Hearing none. Mrs. Regola Dye? Yes. Mr. Thompson? Yes. Mrs. Fiesel? Yes. Mrs. Getzman? Yes. And Dr. Bennett? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to welcome everyone this evening. Uh, what a lovely group. Um, and we are very happy to be here, and thank you, um, Dr. Dill and Wigan Street staff for hosting us this evening, and we look forward to um, meeting at all of our, our various schools. So I don't have anything special to add. Mrs. Getzman, would you? Um, I do not at this time, other than welcome. It's great to see so many Wigan Street parents out, and um, we look forward. It's been fun going to each school, so welcome, and um, thank you for welcoming us into your building. Thank you. Mr. Thompson. Uh, it's really good to be here and it's great to see such a, uh, a great crowd and representing very many things that we're going to be talking about tonight which are all very exciting things for our school district. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Ms. Gulladay. Thank you. Thanks everybody for being here. Uh, young and uh, old. Um, we really appreciate all of the support of every community in um, Knox County, not, not just for Mount Vernon City Schools, but every, every county school. Without assistance from everyone, public schools would not be able to succeed, and we deeply appreciate all of the support that you give us. So thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Fiesel. Um, ditto to much of the same that has been said. Um, I look at the school calendar and it's hard to believe we're at almost the end of the first quarter. So it has been a fast first quarter. And also, um, just to give recognition to Twin Oak being one of 349 schools in the United States. Okay, um, I wanted to give recognition to Twin Oak receiving the National Blue Ribbon Honor Award. Um, that would be um, one of 16 Ohio schools and um, then one of 349 schools in the U.S. And East Elementary received the national recognition in 2014, um, 2014. So I just think we need to applaud elementaries. Thank you. Well, I too would like to welcome you. One of the challenges, obviously, from going uh, building to building, it's 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 the setup, it's the acoustics, it's all of those wonderful aboves, and so we're excited to be here. Uh, at Wigan Street to get a chance to see the wonderful things that are going on here and uh, it'll give the board an opportunity afterwards to uh, to kind of look around and all those little nooks and crannies and and uh, see all those little special places so we're uh, we're certainly glad to be here um, I guess to get started let's go ahead with um, accommodations and communications so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dill and uh, he has a behind the scenes person he'd like to recognize Good evening. Good evening. Let's try again. Good evening. <laughs> there we go. Just make sure everyone's awake. All right. Well, I unfortunately have not had uh, 
the same amount of time the person I want to talk about tonight as everyone else in this room. I've only known this person for my day one was in June, and so I met this person right away on the front door steps of our school, and uh, I'm really glad that she's here tonight. So I'm going to talk about her. Uh, she's an amazing lady to our school and to the tradition of the Wigan Street. I imagine it's difficult for any school to convince their recipient to come accept a behind-the-scenes award. You might find yourself in a PTO meeting just having a casual conversation with someone saying, Hey, you know what, I, I want you just to be available if uh, the board has any questions about the beautiful landscaping in front of our school. And they might just casually accept that invitation. So fortunately she did, because she is here tonight. <laughs> and she has always had Wigan Street Elementary, the kids here at Wigan Street, at the center of her court. And she reminds us pretty frequently to stay positive and to keep the focus on kids. So I'm honored to know her. We are speaking, of course, of Sarah. <laughs> Sarah. <coughs> She has been volunteering at Wigan Street School since her family moved here four years ago. From the moment she arrived, she became an active part of the PTO. She introduced us to the Mumpkin Fundraiser because of her close ties to Fort Meyer Greenhouse. Before she knew it, we had her knees knee deep in fun festival plans. Along with other volunteers, she helped keep, she helped organize games and make sure it ran smoothly. Sarah did such a great job. She was elected president of the PTO, which was just in her second year. Sarah has combined her love of plants and talents as a landscape architect to begin a new project at Wagon Street. She donated her time and talents to the beautification of our school. I don't know if you remember the front of our school, but I know on my day one, it did not look like an elementary school. And this was not because of me, it was because of her and the, and the work of everyone else around her, her team. She sought out landscapers that would be willing to donate their services and found a treasure in TD landscaping. This local company provided materials at cost and donated all their labor. Blue Denim Tree Service also removed stumps and trim trees free of charge. Sarah has since worked to maintain the new area by watering and weeding daily. Sarah has an amazing way of communicating our, our school's needs and connecting the community to support our endeavors. Sarah is more than willing to come in and do whatever needs to be done. She comes here with a smile and a positive attitude. She is a cheerleader for our school, no doubt. No doubt she's a true And she's always looking for a way to make it a better environment for children. Teachers and students appreciate her support and dedication to our school community, which is why it is an honor to all of us to nominate her, Sarah, as our behind the scenes person. Oh, Sarah. for all the work that you do. And we know there are a lot of other people behind the scenes, but certainly you're to be commended and the board is very proud and honored to have you working with us. So thank you very much and thank you. So we're gonna transition into a, a, a pretty special section uh, here for me. I, I uh, had an opportunity several years ago to really have a, a desire to try to step out and to do a little bit more and Wigan Street seemed like the right place and then I got tied in with Mary Catherine and Kenyon and I got tied into Lori and Elizabeth and um, for the first time we started a dual language program at an elementary level and it, is, it, it wouldn't have happened 
if it wasn't for the folks at Kenyon, and it wasn't for your willingness to jump in. Uh, our hope and desire is that as these kindergartners started this year with a FLESS program, that over the course of the next four years, they'll continue to grow in their uh, knowledge and aptitude in the language of Spanish. And so by the time they're fifth graders going off to the middle school, they're really pushing us as a board to bring foreign language down even farther into the middle schools. And um, I I'm excited to hear this presentation. So uh, ladies, I'm just gonna turn it over to you guys and we've got your PowerPoint. I'll pull it up here and you direct me as you'd like to go. PowerPoint. Would you like to have that? <laughs> we brought Mary Catherine because she's the expert. And we just kind of lived out the dream. Um, it's been wonderful. Once a week on Thursdays, her students that she's teaching at Kenyon come into our classroom um, two at a time. She's been with them and they teach a lesson to kindergarten. And then on other days during the week, we have those same students come back during our center time in the afternoon and they spend time with the children at the center that they're working at. We are also um, pulling them in with some of the books that they have read and some of the activities they have done are now available to the kindergarten children at center time. And we've taken pictures and video along the way and we'd like to show you what it looks like when our students visit our classroom. Before we get to the video though, I have to say that the first day we did not prep our kindergarten students. So, and we did that intentionally because we didn't want to influence their thinking. So their eyes were huge when the Kenyan students came in and started speaking Spanish to them. <laughs> and they, you could have heard a pin drop, and that is not frequently the case in kindergarten. No. But they were <laughs> silent and their eyes were huge. And I should also say, so our instructors are novice instructors, so their eyes were huge. <laughs> <laughs> children. There are read-alouds every week. There's a story and often <coughs> it is connected to whatever is going on in our class. We have been studying Mo Willems, so it seemed perfect to bring in the Spanish version of There is a Bird on Your Head. And the whole time they're reading it in Spanish, the kids are repeating back and telling them what's happening. They're using English. So they actually it was a great moment to solidify that understanding. Um, music, videos, song, and stories are used at each and every lesson. There's one of our students reading aloud. They are going to share traditional Spanish books and that will be something that we uh, study as the culture in Spanish, so to connect that to the standards for kindergarten and other children who, have, who are bilingual. This is another book that we have read in English and they found it in Spanish and brought it in and the kids were able to also respond. And then afterwards they were practicing the commands that the David Shannon book taught them. And it fits, it fits in so perfectly with the book that they use and the kids practice doing those skills and then we can use them throughout the week when the kids aren't 
when it's not a Spanish chime. <laughs> that was the first thing they learned. I just love that picture. <laughs> they, every day they walk in, that was how this everything started and why the kids that first week were looking like, what in the world did you just say to me? I'm asking them what their name is and the kids have learned um, to greet them back uh, in Spanish. So I can talk about what we're doing. Yes. What we were doing here. So we, um, I think I'm getting ahead on the slides here, but we um, are using an approach in terms of training the instructors. It's Japanese language study, and what that involves is it's called a pod of teachers, teacher trainees who design a lesson, and then they come in, and you have half of them teaching. So in this case, we have two of them teaching, and one to two of them observing. And what you look at is not the teaching, you look at the learning. They're looking for evidence in the learning. So every time we come in, we have two people teaching and at least one person observing, <laughs> looking at the learning. And the approach that we're using for assessing the learning is what we call dynamic assessment. So we have in each lesson embedded an opportunity, a checkpoint for the instructors to sort of check in on the learning. And so for this day, what we did was we came in with individual name tags and kind of divided the class up into four groups to check. That was our check on introductions, like hello, my name is Ola Mayo. Could they could they respond to the question? Do they understand the question? And so that I think the next slide. Um, <coughs> uh, so that when we sat down to talk about where are we, what should we do to reinforce, every lesson has an opportunity for the for the instructors to check in and kind of evaluate what it is that we need to bring back up in the next lesson or in future lessons. Uh, so that that was our opening activity that day. My stack of maintenance. <laughs> This was a review week where the students, the Kenyan students, divided into stations and kind of recapped and reviewed what the skills were that we've been working on for the first five weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we had three different stations that day. And then Liz came back during center time when he came and pulled children out if they wanted to go out with him. And of course they did. <laughs> You give a kindergartner a ball in the hallway, you know, it's like if you give a mouse a cookie. <laughs> Another station that day. So here they had little hand puppets and you can see smiley faces and frowny faces. And the idea, again, is we would ask them the question, how are you? And could they, could they acknowledge the question by sort of showing, and a lot of them, you know, just nodded their head a lot. They, uh, they recognized what we were asking them, and then some of them would start to repeat. Um, and I think that was our second week working on that, on that interaction. Um, but so that was a different station on that review day. Uh, and here we have what they like. So we, um, when you speak in a, in, a, in a given day, we use about 15,000 words. But of those 15,000 total words, you're actually only using about 1,000 different words. Meaning we communicate, for about 90% of our communication, we use 2 to 3% of the language at our fingertips. So our, our curriculum here is focusing on those high frequency expressions that are going to give them a lot of communicative bang for their buck. And so here's something, it's what we call a collocation. So you can mix and match. So this is me gusta, I like, and then they can mix and match it with a lot of other vocabulary that we've worked on. So that's the focus of our curriculum, like, again, high frequency, high balance, communicative expressions. Um, so that's what she's working on here on their name tags on one side, and says my name is, and on the other, I like, and in theory, they drew something that they like and learned the vocabulary. And they did. It's emerging. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about the student, or the teachers, come back during center time and work with the children. So one of the things that's amazing for me about this center time opportunity is that Kenyan started their intensive language program back in 1980, and we have morning meetings with faculty and evening breakout sessions for small groups for fluency practice. And by being invited to work with the kindergarten teacher, he was here, and they said, well, we would love you to come to center time. And to me, it was a great opportunity because we have extra time with the students to reinforce what we're working on in the morning sessions. And we only come in two afternoons a week, but it's still really, I think, a high value experience for those students to choose to practice um, with, you know, someone they identify as a Spanish language person back in their classroom. 
Um, um, this is your expertise. Okay, so this is, this is the rundown of what we've actually been working on. And I talked about the Japanese language study and the four column planning. So the way they plan their lessons is they have their objective, which is typical. Um, they have their objective and the activities that they'd like to do on it. But for the four columns, you then anticipate what the students are going to say. And we know many of us who've been novice instructors, you know, there's, it takes a really long time to anticipate student questions. And so here they actually have to plan for the student responses and then how they're going to respond to the student responses. Um, and again, then we come in and they look at the learning, they look at the learning so that we can plan our next our next lesson based on what they think was successful or not successful. And here's sort of a run and you can, I mean, I think it's, it's what you would expect, the things that we started with earliest. They're producing independently, and then the rest are sort of emerging, and or they just recognize them, and that's you know that's what we would expect, and we feel like we're on target for five weeks. <laughs> um, these are the next. Let's get to, get to the next one. Uh, so these are the national descriptors for language. Um, it's included in the PowerPoint, but what we're working on includes things like repeating single words, greeting others, saying how I'm doing, saying my name, and so all of these concepts we've already been hitting in our in our first five weeks. And then we'll move into the novice mid, um, where they're more autonomous again with those high frequency collocations. And I will say, I just want to point out that on here it says count to ten. Our students are already counting to ten, and they bring it back during math time later and want us to count in Spanish. I had given them a countdown, and they said, say in Spanish. So then we had to count backwards in Spanish. <laughs> Spanish is not a language that I took. <laughs> so I am learning right with the kindergartners, but I had to think, I had counted in my head forward, and then I was able to say it backwards. But they bring in Spanish any opportunity they can. They enjoy it. And last week was fall break, so we did not have Spanish class, and we all missed it. We did. And, just, well, I actually got ready for it, went to Elizabeth's room real quick, because we were late. Oh, yeah, no Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, I can't recall the book that I was reading aloud. Something with an elephant in it. It made, I don't think it was in Malone's book. And then, all of a sudden, in the middle of the book, one of the kids piped up and said, ah, Elefante. So they had connected, right there, they were sitting there thinking about the Spanish word for something that had come up in one of the lessons. So, and that was done independently. So we love those spontaneous moments. That's kind of what I like to watch for during the week when they're not there. Who is independently bringing it in? to the other things that we're doing. And just on my way over to the meeting, I stopped at Starbucks and Kroger, and I ran into a family with their kindergarten daughter, and I said, oh, count to 10 for her. And then the little girl did it, and so um, it really is, is out of the county. <laughs> So it is spreading, like you said, spreading in the community, but spreading within the school as well. So this would be from Spanish, uh, uh, music class. So we get center time, and it's wonderful that we have this opportunity. Um, thanks to Kenyon and Mary Catherine. So. You can check us out on Facebook. That's right. I share every Thursday. Kindergarten, Wicked Street Elementary Kindergarten has its own Facebook page, and there are updates on there if you 
want to get on and check it out. We're having a blast. We are. Any questions from the board? Yes, thanks to your students and you for um, bringing this about. It's right. really a wonderful partnership. Right. right. For getting us off the ground. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm sure your students are learning that when you teach is when you really learn yourself, too. <laughs> yes, yes. And so the, the slides that were cut, were, were cut where their impressions are like, oh, I didn't realize that this is how you make those connections. We do learn a lot on the other side of the classroom. Um, thank you. I just have a question on when the children, when it's time for their uh, report cards, is there going to be something included in the report card that is a little separate maybe from this? or? We didn't think about that. Just a, <laughs> not only not this year, but maybe. I, I don't mean. I don't even mean like in a grade sense, but like a progress report. Like the children have counted now; they can count to blah blah blah, and you know, in that. A weekly kindergarten schedule that I send home every week, and I usually put in a blurb about that. I know Mary Catherine has put in something as well, and we'll put in another. And so I usually update them with that, as well as the Facebook page. We do have a lot of parents who will go to the Facebook page right. and kind of see right. it today. But as far as the grade cards, no, I don't think we did think about that. And this is a pilot year, so we're, we're still figuring things out sure. as well. And, yeah. and then down the road, um, the program you're hoping to go through till fifth grade, follow these children through with the language skills through fifth grade? or. Yeah, so uh, we have it right now. Um, Kenyon has graciously uh, volunteered Mary Catherine's time with her TAs. I call them TAs. Um, for the first two years, for mm -hmm. kindergarten and first grade, um, this is kind of what we're calling a pilot year. And so as we go into year two, um, we'll continue to get the support. And then as, if we see it going the way I hope it goes, then we'll have to step up and we'll have to provide some resources to keep mm -hmm. this going. So the idea is all the way through fifth grade. Yeah, that'd be great. And the, um, do you think that there would be a way to study the results of the children's language skills compared to other learning that if they take this foreign language, will it assist them in other ways of thinking and incorporating it into uh, higher level thinking and higher level uh, expressions? Would it so there's a lot of research on bilingualism um, and that early exposure to second language makes permanent changes to the brain structures that stave off dementia decades later, for example. Um, but then also there's a lot of benefits with empathy development, just being aware that other languages and cultures are out there so you have empathy and social skills, yeah. in addition to the immediate benefits of learning a second language that also extend to from bilingualism into biliteracy, so reading skills are supported. And then a lot of, you know, I always say all intelligence is pattern recognition, so it also then in turn supports your mathematics. Mm -hmm. so we see a lot of benefits across the board just from introducing this. Yeah. I wonder if you could someday present at uh, the Ohio School Boards Association uh, conference, okay. maybe next year, next fall, it would be great to see uh, our school represented with the with the college and see how partnerships can develop. Well, and I'm sitting here thinking just to be, you know, this is a pilot year, but to be fair to our other elementaries that this could grow and expand, mm -hmm. you know, just... We have to be prepared and that, I think that'd be a great thing. Um, we'd have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, that's great. We've been doing a lot of behind the scenes work. These ladies have been wonderful. Like, absolutely wonderful. Mary Catherine is a professionalist in nature. She's great at what she does. And we really appreciate the partnership with her and with Kenny College. Uh, Lori and Elizabeth are outstanding, as you know. It, it's been tremendous in our meetings. We'll talk about how the lessons are going and what they are going to be in the future. And right away, we're going to talk about they will connect somehow to the standards and connect to things that they're doing in the classrooms. So they're thinking of those things already. We meet on a monthly basis to kind of do that behind the scenes. You know, what's going well, what's not going so well, what comes in between. 
and they did a tremendous work. So I'm very proud of them. Thank you, ladies. Yeah, thank you. We do have um, a couple um, for public participation. Um, I would like to um, call it to your attention. It, it does state on um, our form, but we haven't been sticking to it, and I've been reminded that I should mention it. Um, each statement made by a participant should be limited to three minutes um, duration. So um, I think our Ms. Mrs. Rose has been our timekeeper in years past. Um, so. With that, we'll have our first person, um, Courtney Dukoski. <laughs> okay, everyone. Um, where's the stage? <laughs> it's blocked off. You're, you're thinking Elvis right now, aren't you? <laughs> um, I just wanted to share you know, the music that you're hearing and I'm just going to share what an absolutely positive experience it's been. Um, I was really anxious with my sense when I was told to push the moment and just to be so well played here, John Chris, so he was good. But, you know, I never wanted to be, um, I was just, I don't know, I was just, 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 I was they go home from school and they get out and watch. Like, I'm like, who are these children? Because, you know, usually they're crunching. They're still some crunching, but usually they're crunching. You know, there's a calm down. But to have them come home and say, Mommy, what's this? Or, what I saw Mommy? What I do with Daddy? And then you see them running Mommy and Daddy. And I saw pumpkin. You see them being made up. House, <laughs> just like the kids are with us. And you know, it wasn't just about decorating, it was about the mental decorations and stuff and all the words. And then on a Friday, um, one of my sons had a strep throat. And he was just sad because he wanted to go to school. And my other son, like, if you, if you made one of those go to school, not that I want to know, just like tears and it was awful. I have Janae Schoenkel. So I wish I had heard her two minutes and 30 seconds because I didn't practice and I wanted to come out of water time. So my name is Janae Schoenkel. My daughter, Lily, attended Wigan Street from here to fifth grade. She just started sixth grade at the middle school. Um, and my daughter, Anna, just started in first grade at here at Wigan Street. She has a seat out outside of the time. Um, and first, I just want to say that I'm really glad that specials are back after 45 minutes. Um, and to see you in your garden as my recess. Um, I also wanted to just celebrate uh, Wigan Street for a minute since the board is here um, and Wigan Street parents have been active and vocal. Uh, I want to be part of that. Um, and I particularly wanted to talk about how I've seen play work wonders while my kids here. Um, the two most important things that play has done for my children is that it's taught them, like Marcus kids, that learning is fun and that learning happens everywhere. Uh, one of Anna's favorite projects um, here in the city play, where she had a family and a job, and she lived in Australia. <laughs> um, and we saw that extended school in her regular life, and her friends from church, passed over like a uh, 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 towel with pink rays on it, and like she was learning about Australia everywhere. She was wondering if she could maybe get more kind of sleep from it. How could we do that? Making connections. Um, she learned about geography and animals and how to work with others and economics. Um, she also learned about other cultures. Third grade buddies worked with kindergartners in the city play on some days and they learned economics as well and the 
kids got practice interacting across grade levels. Um, in fifth grade social studies, Lily and her class had a wagon train project um, in which they also had fictional families and had to travel the Oregon Trail. Um, and she really enjoyed the elements of story and competition, um, but she was using math to calculate how much they could carry and learn social studies about the challenges of frontier life. Um, both girls have very fond memories of the gingerbread play, which builds literacy skills and music and art um, and gives the whole school a common experience. Um, and as a result of this, Anna is a self motivated learner. Um, she practices counting to 100 on the screen. Just um, she makes up math problems and solves them like fun. Uh, she points out words she can spell on signs. Uh, she notices rhymes in daily conversation in 30 seconds. <laughs> Kids learn to play on a daily basis at Women's Street, and it's really effective. Um, they also participate annually in the Global Day of Play, which is a in of Japan, um, in which students in all grades play all day. Um, some might see that as a wasted day, but kids are still learning essential skills. They're learning social skills as they collaborate, uh, which is important in life in general, but in jobs in particular. Um, they are often building things using math and engineering, they're testing ideas as young scientists, and most importantly, they're learning to follow their own curiosity, which is important for artists and entrepreneurs alike. So I just want to celebrate how amazing the music is in incorporating play into how it looks like. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, we also have some monthly reports, and I believe that um, Halsey Ann Thomas is here. <laughs> Hello, I'm not going to keep this concise, but um, I'm just here to offer the high school report and the high school report. So we had homecoming a couple weekends ago, and we also had a parade, which was a major success. We had 11 businesses participate in our window competition, which was very exciting, and we are anticipating doing it again next year. We also had um, approximately 800 kids come to homecoming, which is exciting as well, the high school. Um, yes, so, and then, uh, speaking of homecoming and football and things along those lines, our last away game will be this Friday as Spanish Senior. We're taking a spirit bus again this coming week. Um, and then that following week will be our last home game, and it's also senior night. So any of you know the seniors who play football this year, anything like that, um, so show some support. Moving away from that, we'll be heading into basketball game, which is very exciting as well, and other winter sports like wrestling and swimming, things along those lines. Um, our powder puff game will be October 29th. So, Mr. Patterson, very exciting. To move into more of an arts oriented subject area, the choir concert is tomorrow at 7 30 p.m., and then this Thursday, the orchestra concert is also at 7 p.m. Uh, next week, next Thursday, the 23rd, is the jacket jam concert as well, and then it's also at 7. And then to move on to the more academic standpoint of everything, NHS is having their blood drive the 24th of October, and that will be from 8 to 2, I believe. And um, their new applications were due this week, so their induction ceremony will be coming November 14th. And I'm not quite sure what time that will be. I think it's later in the evening. Though. Yes. And then in the NOAA is also having a tournament November 5th. And I'm not sure about the time either for that, but I'm sure there's Halsey Ann, can you tell us again the times for the concert tomorrow and yes. Thursday? The choir is at 7.30, <coughs> and then on Thursday, orchestra is at 7. 7. And then the and they're both at the high school? Yes. Okay. And the auditorium. And Halsey Ann, we would be remiss to say congratulations to you. She was our homecoming queen. So. <laughs> Thank you. Darcy? <laughs> Not much to share, but we're wrapping up the third Friday. Um, Monday is our split professional day of work day. I think the majority of the district is working on Friday. Uh, and then there's a group from the high school traveling to Stupenville that day, too. Um, then we'll see the second half of the day, we'll wrap up our days and get the next quarter. Great. Thank you very much. And I don't think Mike is here. All right, we're.
Hasan, or there's no items for board discussion and superintendent's report. I do have uh, one addition um, to the agenda tonight. Um, <coughs> Lori Tyson is be heading to the FFA Livestock Convention in Louisville. So you'll find that addition in the certificated personnel section of tonight's agenda. I have a number of items to share uh, relative to the superintendent's report. They're items for information. Um, and the first one I want to share is a recess survey. So um, we've had some good conversation over the past couple months regarding recess, specials, those kinds of things. And, Trust me, that does not go unnoticed by the board or by myself. And so we asked lots of questions and uh, uh, we ended up doing a survey. Uh, we feel like we have lots of uh, local experts in the way of teachers right here in Mount Vernon um, that can share their results. So uh, I thought I'd show it to you real quick. I just shut this survey down on Friday. And so I think this will be good for you to see. Um, real quickly, I'll just show you the questions. So the demographics, what grade level do you most identify? We were going to group these, but then we thought, let's drill it right down to the different grade levels. So <laughs> a teacher had to choose a grade level. Do you like having outdoor or indoor activities prior to the start of the day, yes or no? Do you think students should have a.m. recess between the start of school and lunch? And it was yes or no. And then there were some others. If you answered yes to the previous question, how long do you believe would be appropriate for an AM recess? Um, if you said no, then you just select NA. Do you think students have enough uh, adequate time for recess during the lunch time? Yes, no, or other? Do you think students should have a PM recess between lunch and the end of the day? Yes and no. If you answered yes, give us an idea how long. And then do you have flexibility in your day to give students breaks, recesses, when you feel it is needed, yes or no. Um, and then finally, do you incorporate physical activity for your students within your instructional day, during that instructional time? Those were some things that had kind of come up through our conversations, and quite frankly, I was really interested in what our um, elementary staff would, how they would respond. And so we had 93 folks respond. I sent it out to all of the elementaries. Um, and so this is kind of what you're going to take a look at. So obviously the demographics were all over the place because, you know, K, one, two, three, four, five. You've got some, uh, there were some. Can you enlarge it? I can, yeah, can I enlarge it? I don't know if I can enlarge it right here. I'm sorry. Is it hard to see? It'll be easier when I move it down. The three dots on the far right at the top. You click on them, it should. I don't think it's going to be there. This, this, one, this one is going to be less significant only from the fact that all these little colors you see, they happen to be, they were, they're like uh, special education teachers who they teach all grade levels. I have librarians who are in here. Um, we have some of our specials teachers were in there. And so there's a, there's a whole list of different groups that maybe didn't fit within a specific grade band. All right? So when we asked the question, do you like having outdoor indoor activities prior to the start of the school day? We had 92 responses. 90% of them said yes, they like having some activity before the day got started. So uh, certainly that is, um, is a positive thing. Um, we realize that every kid gets here maybe early enough to have an extended time, but, uh, but it is saying that they like that part of the start of the day. Do you think students should have an AM recess between the start of school and lunch? Um, this was really about 50-50. Now what I found when I drilled down a little bit further, your kindergarten, first and second grade, much higher propensity for them to say, yes, we'd like to have something in the morning. As the students got a little bit older, as the teachers got older, I guess in this case, um, they didn't see quite the same level of need to have a morning recess since they just came in at nine o'clock. Um, and then we asked that question, okay, if we have a morning recess, um, how much time do you think would be appropriate? 50% of them thought it was about 15 minutes. Now realize I, I gave them some choices from 10 to 15 to 20. And so about 50% stood there, a uh, very small portion said 20 minutes in the morning. And then all the NAs are people who didn't really think that they needed a recess in the morning. Generally your older teachers. Um, do you think students have adequate time for recess during the lunchtime? 
and you're seeing a pretty overwhelming yes we believe that's a good amount of time and i know even here at wigan street you you changed the modification to go from i think 30 minutes to 40 minutes and 20 minute block so um, it feels like that they feel like that lunchtime which is generally in in the entire district is this hour block of eating and activity time I found this to be interesting. Do you think students should have a p.m. recess between lunch at the end of the day? The interesting part was the numbers really rose on this. So while we had about 50-50 in the morning, in the <laughs> afternoon, now you're looking at three quarters of the teachers thought, you know what, I think there is some, it does make some sense to be looking at some afternoon uh, breaks, recess, that type of thing. One of the things that we are doing, um, and here was a question about how much time again. And so you've got most of them saying 15 minutes, 64%. You know, you've got your few that said that they you know, didn't need a recess. And then of course you've got your 10 minutes and your 20 minutes. Um, this is something that all of our teachers do, but I wanted to ask the question. So most of our principals will allow teachers if they feel their kids need a break in the afternoon, they say, you know what, if you feel you need to take them out, take them out, but you're responsible for them. And so I wanted to get a sense of how many of them really feel empowered to do that. And, you know, I had 60% that felt that way, but there was about 15% that, you know, they, they were asking the question, Am I, can I really go out? Um, and so I found that to be kind of interesting. Because I had an other in here, um, you're seeing lots of other little things there that are more comments than they are anything else. Um, so by and large, 60% of them feel like they can take them out if they need to, but they have to watch them on their own. This was an interesting one, and this is my last question. You incorporate physical activity for your students within your instructional day. 91 responses and getting close to 80% said they did. That shocked me quite frankly. I thought it'd be almost 100%. And I had to dig down a little deeper into this one. Now what I found out was of this 23%, by the way, that 23% was, you can see it blinking, 21, 21 of the respondents. Um, they were in very specific categories. They weren't really my K1, 2, 3, 4, 5 teachers. They were intervention specialists who only get their kids for 20, 30 minute increments. So they didn't take, you know, they needed that time. They were some of my specialist teachers who answered it this way. And so by and large, my K1 through five teachers do incorporate physical activity within their day. So they're not just sitting in their seats, you know, from nine o'clock to, to lunch. I had to go one step further and I wanted to know, well, what are you doing? This amazed me because I'd never heard of this before. And you know, this is going to be like three pages worth of stuff. Um, but it told me everything that they're doing. And there's something called Go Noodle that must have taken over. I don't know what Go Noodle is, but it made me look it up. And so I got on the internet and said, what is Go Noodle? All our teachers are Go Noodling. I mean, they talk about it. And the best I can say, it's like video dance. So it's like, okay, everybody stand up, hamburgers, hot dog, I don't know, but um, they're incorporating those kinds of activities when they sense that their students are kind of kidding a little bit, like they need to move a little bit. So I found it to really be good information. I'm going to share all of this information back with our teachers. Uh, I, whenever I take a survey, I think it's very fair to send that back to them. We'll talk about this as a principals group, but um, you know, all this came about because of good conversation over the last couple of months. So uh, I wanted to share that with you and hope you maybe found some value in that. Um, and board members have any questions relative to that? Now, it, uh, just in my own personal experience, the answer doesn't surprise me from teaching music from K through five for 35 years. Uh, whenever I walked past the teachers' rooms, they were doing everything. <laughs> there wasn't anything that they couldn't try to keep the kids uh, engaged and interested. So um, I'm really proud of them all. The second thing I have on your items of information is something that is really exciting for me as well. This is kind of a, a 
it's just kind of a, one of those exciting nights because I am really excited about this plus stuff. Uh, but this Education Gateway Project is something that we've been talking about for some time. We've been talking about it in bits and pieces. Um, and it's uh, most recently that we kind of brought this stuff together. And I want to share with you what this is. All right, so the Education <coughs> Gateway Project Um, is a continuation of the collaboration between Ariel and Mount Vernon community in one aspect. In 2014-15, we completed phases one and two of the stadium renovation. All right. <clears throat> now, the Board of Education, looking forward, has identified a couple of real critical needs, including the completion of Yellow Jacket Drive extension, the replacement of our transportation and maintenance facility, and a community field house concept. Uh, that was proposed and supported by the Jack and Booster Club to fill the locker room needs that really were part of this 2014. It was three phases back then and we couldn't get to the third phase, which was kind of this community field house locker room uh, piece of that. So we brought all three of these things, these three initiatives, and we brought them all together in what we're calling the Education Gateway Project. And you'll see them kind of listed over here on the side. And so those things coming together, uh, I think is really gonna have a nice impact for the district moving forward. The first is Yellow Jacket Drive Extension. So if you've ever been to the high school and middle school at 7.30 in the morning or at three o'clock in the afternoon, you will understand exactly what we're talking about. There really are just two access ways into Mount Vernon Middle School and High School, um, and that's through the Career Center or through Yellow Jacket Drive. And so for about 15 minutes there in the morning, it is just a real um, bog jam. It's a safety concern as well. Um, so during arrival and dismissal time, nearly 2,800 students on that campus alone and parents rely on those two access points. Safety and first responder uh, response time during those emergencies, times would be critically important and congestion is just quite frankly frustrating. So the addition of Yellow Jacket Drive extension to Cougar Drive would provide a third access point that would greatly improve school safety and traffic flow around the campus. All right, and here's where it's really been kind of special because this is a collaborative work. The city of Mount Vernon has committed to the civil engineering and site work. It will bring a 12 inch water line located on Cougar Drive to our school campus, which is currently being under service with a six inch line. I'll tell you when I came here in 2013, a year later, we have been talking to the city about this probably for the last four or five years. They see a need, we just never had that impetus to take it over the top. We're also working really collaboratively with MVNU. Uh, the property that sits adjacent to the high school, middle school campus is MVNU's property, but they see value in this connector drive as well. And so working collaboratively to secure that land necessary to make the extension possible. And then through the help of the Booster Club, and more specifically Bob Teal, who I did see stopped in here, um, the Ohio Operating Engineers have an apprenticeship training program down in Logan, Ohio. Every year they pick a project to do. Bob contacted them on behalf of the district and the Booster Club and said, we got a project, would you be interested? We went through an application process and we were approved. And so they're gonna come and do all of the labor and all of the equipment free of charge. They said we had to buy them pizza and so we said we could probably <laughs> uh, afford to do that. So if you're looking at those three things it now makes this Yellow Jacket Drive extension a real possibility when we bring it all together. The other one was our transportation and maintenance building. Currently it's located out on Harcourt Road if you're going out of town. Um, you know, it sits on 1.9 acres off of Hardcore Road. We have a total of 28 buses and several maintenance and plow vehicles in there. We currently have a, a very aging two-bay garage um, uh, with a small driver's lounge, two offices, and quite frankly, an inadequate maintenance area. Um, our maintenance folks actually are housed at Central Office because we don't have the space. The building was built in 1954, and if you've been out there, if you walk around, you'll see it needs significant repair. Um, and quite frankly, the garage and maintenance areas are too small. 
a new transportation and maintenance build, building located adjacent to the middle school high school campus would not only provide adequate space, but some significant savings and greater efficiency. If you know where our buses kind of start the day and end the day, it always seems to revolve around that middle school, high school campus. Currently, it's about three miles to go from Harcourt Road across the railroad tracks, and now that Parrot Street is blocked off, you've got to kind of go downtown and come back. It's amazing what just seven miles twice a day will add up in the area of mileage and fuel, not to mention cost uh, to drive that distance. And so the ability to have some significant uh, efficiencies um, would be wonderful. A new facility design would allow the district to look forward, uh, providing a facility that can accommodate some future initiatives that we have. Um, here's kind of a, a, here's what we've had bid it out already. Right now I said we had two bays. Um, well, I'll look up top. Right now we have 4,900 square feet in our current bus maintenance area. This facility would increase it to 12,000 square feet. We go from four bus bays uh, in this new design versus two in our old design. It improves serviceability to larger buses. Uh, four years ago, we started saying, you know what, why are we only buying these small buses? Well, we were buying smaller buses because we couldn't fit them in the garage. But well, we realized we could buy 84 passenger buses instead of 60 passenger buses, and we could get greater efficiency, but we couldn't service them. Reducing travel time, fuel, and labor costs, provide office space for transportation and maintenance. Uh, maintenance and storage facilities would significantly increase. As you take a look at this design here, we've got the four overhead doors, um, we've got a parts cage, we have a mezzanine over the top of this office area that is all storage. You're going to notice a larger maintenance area with bigger doors so that we can take on some bigger projects in the break room. The uh, part down here that even becomes more interesting is we're all about sharing. I told you we were doing collaborative work with MBNU. Uh, they have three buses. Well, they don't need a bus garage for three buses, so they park them just outside of their facility. There's no reason why they can't go right across the street, and we're talking within eye shot, uh, store their buses there. If they need to maintain their buses, they can use our bays and we can use our mechanics in a working relationship with them. So it provides a great sharing opportunity. And there's also the potential for CNC capable buses in the future. I think that's gonna be a future for us um, with fuel and things the way they are. And there's a major gas line running right down the middle of our property. CNG buses could provide us some real opportunities for not only savings down the road, but a more greener type of, uh, of a look at how we operate. So that's that part of it. And then there's the community field house, and this has been the dream of a lot of folks for a long time. Um, the, to build that facility would serve the district and provide expanded opportunities for our, for our um, community. The school, youth, and community athletic activity programs, quite frankly, have been underserved for decades due to really lack of facilities. We walk around our conference today and we're seeing facilities that quite frankly, are just ahead of where we're at. And we want to make sure that we can provide to our students um, the real benefit of this. So when you see the word community field house, don't lose sight of that word community, because that's really important. It would provide a facility that would be the hub of school, youth, and community activities. It enhances this connection between MBNU, the Kokosi Gap, Memorial Park, Aerial Foundation Park. This kind of sits right in the middle of all that. Um, we would host regional recreational tournaments that would bring more visitors to Mount Vernon. Uh, fitness programming for our seniors and our community. There really is no place as the weather gets cooler for our, um, our seniors to go and get that exercise. This facility has a walking track inside to help serve those folks. And there's also another little dream of mine is to pro provide the or have the opportunity for before and after school programming for Mount Vernon students and families. All right. And um, so picture this and, and this this is a down the road thing. But if every bus starts and ends right here next to this community field house, can you picture parents dropping their kids off at seven o'clock in the morning? And then when our buses go to back to, to take kids to the elementaries, 
those kiddos get on the bus and get dropped off? Or how about when they get on a bus and they go home, but they can be dropped off at the community center um, because that's where our buses end their day and the parents could pick them up at five o'clock. I mean, just thinking outside the box of the different possibilities that could be there. Um, so what does it look like? Uh, this is just a real quick schematic. It would be three courts in design. You're looking at large spaces off to the uh, back side um, for multi-purpose rooms, wrestling rooms, weight rooms. There'll be a walking track going around it. You're seeing locker rooms and restrooms and some office space up front. Um, and of course, I've listed those things on that back side. Um, we have taken this out to bid and we have awarded this bid to Adina Construction. Um, we have a member from Adina here tonight, and so we're, you know, we're excited to provide this opportunity if the board is ready to move forward with this project, uh, this gateway project, to see this come to fruition. Um, there's a kind of a look of what that rendering might look like located right off the parking lot uh, to the stadium. We have some uh, prominent business people who have talked for some time about the importance of just upgrading our facilities for our community and for our kids. Just to give you an example of where this is at, so you see the stadium there, so you see those areas in brown. Just uh, the parking lot would be uh, renovated. You see the uh, road that would kind of extend out to Cougar Drive there. It probably won't look quite like that in, when it's finally done. It probably will branch into a little bit of a T and then go up Cougar Drive. Um, but we'll have that other access point to get into the campus and it'll be safer. Um, the brown buildings there, uh, we didn't separate them there, but one would be the, the community field house and the other would be the uh, transportation maintenance garage. If I would scroll down right across Yellow Jacket Drive, there's your middle school campus and your high school campus right there. All right, so it just really provides a nice gateway, um, hence the name, right to um, the corridor that is our middle school, high school area. All right, so the final two slides here is working with community partners to make this gateway project a reality. A strong committed leadership from the board of education and administration working quite frankly collaboratively with our jacket boosters um, the jacket boosters have really been instrumental in this community field house piece and uh, the conversations we've had over the last year have been really helped shape a third of this whole project we want to use local contractors on this work and adina is going to help us do that um, from custom comfort to gel wind windows, Stafford plumbing, small sand and gravel, bebout masonry, and the list could grow. I mean, we want this to be a Mount Vernon community project. We need financial partners willing to invest in the future uh, of this for our students and our community. So what Mount Vernon um, City Schools has made a goal, as we've talked about this over the last half a year, is for the community field house, we want to use non-tax generated revenues to help support this project. What does that mean? We get casino monies from um, this, the federal government. Remember, we used to get lottery monies and somehow that all dried up and they funneled in different directions, but we do get casino monies now and uh, we get about $200,000 a year and we've been getting that. We want to use that non-tax generated money really focused on the field house part of that. Um, and then the board would also utilize PI dollars when it comes to Yellow Jacket Drive Extension and the maintenance garage. Uh, the Jacket Boosters, on the other hand, they're ready. They're ready for a green light to go forward. They've had lots of conversations about raising money, and uh, they have an ambitious goal to make private partnerships a reality. They've already kind of. Uh, raise or have commitments of almost a million dollars towards this project and they've not even kicked it off yet. All right, so there's an excitement there. Um, and maybe for the first time I could even announce that uh, through conversations with Aerial Corporation, um, they're excited about the Gateway Project. And through the fundraising efforts of the Booster Club are willing to match dollar for dollar the money that we bring in to help fund this. That's quite a gift, and uh, it's a gracious gift, but it just goes to the sense that this is about community, and they want it to be about community. And so this three-prong approach is really, really important. Um, so with all that being said, um, I'm excited to share that part with you. 
down in our business portion of our agenda tonight um, is an action item. Um, the board has seen all this information before, so this isn't a surprise. I'm not springing it on them, but there'd be an action item that would authorize both the superintendent and the treasurer to secure the financing to move forward on this project. And uh, I'm certainly hopeful when we get down to that section. Does anybody have any questions from the board at this point relative to this gateway project or comments? So I know we're in the beginning stages, but you know, I just hear community. So, you know, I'm sitting here jotting notes and I'm wondering like, will there be a meeting room? Um, what can the community access? Um, you know, I know we have a weight room. Will that just be for the students? So I'm, I'm and I know there's a liability Absolutely. factor and you know, we want to make this we want to make this accessible to the extent possible. Uh, in most collaborative efforts that I've seen in other districts, there will be these pigeonhole times where teams will practice, but outside of some of those times, we open it up to the community. We would open it up to the YMCA. We are looking at these community rooms um, that would be something that we could add to this. Now it's not in our cost feature right now, but when I go back to that before school and after school situation, those kind of rooms could be crucial to not only serve in that capacity, but serve as community, community meeting rooms. Um, partitions would go down between the courts so that certain groups could use this part, other groups could use this part. And so we want to make it as accessible as we can to the community. Thank you. Any other questions from the board or comments? Well, I already mentioned about uh, Bob Teal and uh, our, our AD, Justin, and uh, all the work that's gone into getting it to this point. And uh, seriously, if, if there hadn't been such a push and, and momentum built there, um, the biggest leg of all this probably wouldn't be discussed. But then I would also say thanks to the creativity of uh, Mr. Cedar and being able to pull all this together into one project that actually advances and brings us more into modern times in Mount Vernon City Schools. Uh, I will say this somewhat jokingly, but uh, I appreciate it being quoted in a previous article. Uh, but referencing Olentangy City Schools and saying that we, we won't be and we're not Olentangy and we, we don't aspire to be that big, huge school that they are. But let's just face it, Delaware, Olentangy and others in Delaware County have, have a lot of things and a lot of resources to pull from for their students. And we are obviously lagging way behind, but I would say if you go to Worcester, Ohio, someplace that's a little more comparable to who we are, and you go through that facility that they have, which is much on the order of what it is that we're wanting to do, and if you had the opportunity to visit that place and go in and see what's going on in there with people walking the track, senior citizens, or hey, uh, I don't know whether I fit into that mode or not, but I'll be walking that track. <laughs> Right, but um, and uh, athletic events uh, going on where people are coming into the town, into Worcester for these competitive things, volleyball or whatever it may be. It was exciting to me, and then seeing over here, here's the YMCA who's participating and helping to coordinate some of these activities. It involved the community, thus the title, and so um, uh, I am really really, really excited. And I am very appreciative of those who've already committed uh, to help uh, fund this. And so we as a board wouldn't be talking here tonight if we weren't certain that that funding was there to see this become reality. But we still have a lot of community drive work to do because we, the community needs to, to weigh in. It can't just be a one private business or a few people. This is an opportunity for our, our district, our community to rise up and really do something great, not just for the kids, even though that's who we're targeting, but to rise up and do something that's good for all. So I'm excited and again, I, I, I applaud uh, Mr. Cedar on uh, organizing this in such a way that pulls it all together. So. 
Well, that leads us right into our third point, and we'll jump right back into the more boring parts of the agenda, perhaps, right? Um, thought exchange. Thought exchange was something we brought to the district at the end of last year, and I don't know how many of you got a chance to participate in the thought exchange, um, but it's a way for us to engage our community because we truly want to listen. And so last, late last spring, we did a thought exchange that asked two questions. What are some things that we could improve upon and what are some things we're doing well? And so school obviously ended, we left, we got all those results back. Um, we're going to be posting those results on our website when our community newsletter comes out here in the next week and a half. We have some wonderful information that came out of that. Lots of things to improve upon, and we, we are really doing some special things. One of the things that came out loud and clear, and, and if you were on there and poked around um, and, and looked at that process, and remember it was share a thought, all right? So you share a thought based on a general question. You then see those thoughts that everybody else shared, and then you have a chance to rate those thoughts. Five star means, you know what, I agree and so on and so on. Or maybe seeing a thought gives you another thought and you type in the thought and it just kind of funnels its way out. Um, we had, and I'll, I'll probably be pretty darn close, 792 thoughts were shared last spring. Eight, over 800 thoughts totally. And a couple that rose to the top. <laughs> It was being brought up at graduation at Kenya, where the restrooms at the high school, I mean, it, it just went viral. It was, we got some work to do on the restrooms, but you know what? It shared something with us, and we have invested some significant dollars, um, and hopefully by uh, Thanksgiving, the high school will see the fruits of that. We are renovating and redoing all of those restrooms at the high school. And so that's our way to say, you know what, we've listened, yeah. Um, so with that in mind, we want to continue this community engagement. There's a reason why we're going around at all these different buildings this year. It's so that not only can we connect with our local community and our local areas, but it's a chance for us to see these facilities. You know, the Education Gateway part, that, that certainly is, there's some facility aspects there. Some of it is the community piece with the boosters and certainly transportation and maintenance, we've got a lot of work to do there. But I think our facilities go well beyond just there. We need to find out more about our facilities within the district. We currently have six elementaries, we have a middle school and a high school, all varying ages. We've talked about a building report cards, but I want to hear from our community what they think. And so on October 29th through November 12th, the two week time period, the question is going to be this. What are some important things you appreciate about our current facilities and what opportunities do you see as we develop a plan to improve our facilities for our students both now and in the future? That will just lend itself towards thoughts. People will start sharing thoughts and then we'll start reading those thoughts and we'll star them and we'll think of another thought. But it only works if we get our community engaged in going on and, and responding to those. So we're going to start getting this thought exchange message out in the coming weeks so that we can get as many people stepping on to participate in that exchange. Because what you share with us really does matter. Okay? All right. So with that being said, we're going to move on to our items, of, uh, our recommended items for board approval. In the superintendent section, we have one item for board consideration, uh, home and community school student participation in athletics 2018-19, uh, completion of all paperwork. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Okay, I would entertain a motion to approve um, the home community school student presentation. I'll make a motion. Thank you, Ms. Cezanne. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Bullardai. Were there any comments? Okay, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Mrs. Fiesel? Yes. Mrs. Rabolodai? Yes. Mr. Thompson? Yes. Mrs. Getzman? Yes. And Dr. Bennett? Yes. Motion carried. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to very briefly comment on the um, student achievement in depth research project and um, instead of all the short items. Um, there was a study done 
about high school students with uh, school issues devices like our Chromebooks. And one of the things that was quite interesting um, that twice as many principals, 60% in 2017, responded that they are providing them versus two years ago in 2015 when it was just 27%. So it, it is expanding throughout um, our schools in Ohio and the nation. They also did a speak up survey um, as a national initiative of Project Tomorrow, and this is an education focused nonprofit. Uh, it reached almost, it, it reached um, 341,000 students in 2017, and it found some district differences in what students with and without mobile devices said they did in school. Um, so, this was kind of interesting. I think we're very happy that we have Chromebooks for our high school and middle school students, and many of our elementaries use them um, quite extensively. But high schoolers um, assigned to a laptop or a Chromebook were more likely to do internet research, to create documents to share, uh, to check their grades, and to get reminders about tests or homework due dates. And among the high school students assigned these devices, 60% said they had emailed their teachers with questions. And you may not think that's um, very important, but um, the research points out that um, it's more that students want to share that question before they arrive at class because they have a problem, they just want someone to know. And then when they go to class the next day, they can arrive knowing their teacher already is aware of the problem. So just the fact that there's that communication between our students and our teachers, I think is really a positive thing. Now whether teachers have the time to respond to all these emails <laughs> might be another concern, but um, I think it's really important that um, what we're doing um, is benefiting our kids and getting them um, to be more involved in research and all the things that we mentioned. So that's just real brief tonight. So we'll move ahead then to the recommendations uh, for approval. Thank you. We have uh, three items for board approval tonight. Overnight extended field trip for our FCCLA State Leadership Conference. Uh, we also have, and this is in the year 2020, so if you're really interested, a uh, foreign trip to Ecuador and the Galapagos Islands. We're getting a lot more um, foreign travel by our high school uh, students, which I think is a wonderful thing. And then we also have an overnight extended field trip, student trip, excuse me, um, to Holiday Valley in New York with our ski club. So those uh, three items for board approval. Okay, I would entertain a motion to approve those items as read. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Rudoladai. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Mrs. Getzman. And are there any questions? Okay, would you call the roll, please? Mrs. Regola Dye? Yes. Mrs. Getzman, yes. Mr. Thompson? Yes. Mrs. Fiesel? Yes. And Dr. Bennett? Yes. Motion carried. Thank, Thank you. you. And fiscal services, are you going to? Yes, <laughs> I will do fiscal services tonight. Unfortunately, our treasurer is feeling a little under the weather, uh, but she's uh, given me some great notes just to share. I, item number one, I won't even open that one up. The board, you've had that um, really in the shares right now in our revenue side. 34% of our revenues uh, are in, and we're about 24% on our expenditures, which makes sense. We're about a quarter of the way through. And so right now on that financial side, everything looks pretty good on the uh, expenditure and revenue side. Um, she has listed there for you the five-year uh, financial forecast. Uh, I know you probably looked over them this weekend. Uh, it'll always be there. She'll be um, um, giving those to the state uh, auditor to put on that website. But she has given me some highlights, and I'd like to just share those highlights with you quickly. Uh, all of these details are certainly inside of the, uh, of the document, um, but I think these are important ones to mention. So on the revenue side of things, um, we plan to spend about the same amount as we receive. So anytime expenses and revenues come in right about the same number, we're doing pretty well. Uh, it's been six years since we received funds from our new levy using the current assumptions. We should be able to continue for three or four uh, more years at the current funding levels. Uh, we do continue to see some increases in our unrestricted state funding, um, although the past two years have been a little smaller than usual. But it's maintained. Um, we do continue to receive additional funds from the state of Ohio's economically disadvantaged uh, students. 
Um, and the tune this year is uh, $532,000, and that's a lot of money. Unfortunately, when you get more money like that, it means you're economically disadvantaged to perhaps an even greater extent, which is um, you know, it's certainly something we'd like to see change. The valuation of a residential property, um, you know, from year 2017, we're up, uh, has increased by over 7%. Uh, in 2017, there was a triennial update, and in the 2020, there'll be a reappraisal. Um, interestingly enough, she notes here that when you have emergency levies, and we have a number of emergency levies, those are dollar amount levies. So those dollar amount levies don't grow as your, uh, as your appraised value grows. You know, we do have some inside millage as do all districts, so when you have a millage calculation, that grows um, as, uh, as your valuation grows. Our earnings investments will continue to increase. I know we've showed you those earning pages before. You know, three, four years ago, we were barely breaking $10,000 in interest earning. Uh, last year, we were up over $100,000 on interest earning. Obviously, you have more to earn interest. That's a good thing. Uh, but of course, the markets have been doing better, all right? We were receiving a large reimbursement from Medicaid this year, a little over $200,000 from Medicaid reimbursement. And so that certainly is a positive. Uh, total revenues this year is forecasted to be about 1.45% uh, higher than fiscal year last year. So a real slight increase in revenues. Then on the expenditure side, um, salary for staff are projected to increase in 2019 by about 2.6%. Uh, All right, younger staff do retirements have helped lower some of the salaries and keep our percentages uh, a little bit lower, and that's a good thing. When you consider that almost 80 to 85% of our budget is personnel and salaries, that's the area that you seem to be able to make the, the greatest impact. Um, health insurance costs. We had a really good year last year. We were self-insured, um, and actually our premiums um, stayed the same with a zero increase, but it actually lowered our health insurance costs. So we believe a lot of proactive work with our um, health committees um, was really, really beneficial. We just had a, a health committee meeting a week ago, and um, you know we're kind of staying right in that ballpark. It kind of goes up and down a little bit depending upon the cycles, but. Um, we continue to work collaboratively with both of our unions relative to health insurance. Um, this is probably the area that we have the least amount of control over. It's our purchase services. Those costs have risen over the years uh, to a million dollars. And many of these are beyond our control. They're services for handicapped students, tuition students from other schools that we're educating and they're handicapped students. So um, this is one of those areas that um, can be frustrating at times, uh, and we continue to have to work with it. But based on early figures, according to Judy, for tuition costs, we expect this amount to decrease by almost half a million dollars this year, settling back to maybe previous levels. Uh, total expenditures uh, have increased by around 1%. Uh, that's just a little bit higher than the year in the past. So here's the overview. Uh, we continue to, if we continue to make good spending decisions, focusing on academic efforts, our facilities and technology, um, uh, it'll really help us go a long way. Our carryover balance is expected to remain stable uh, for the fiscal year. In the succeeding year, fiscal balances will slowly begin to decline. Um, we believe, based upon assumptions, the board may need to consider a levy for new money sometime uh, in 2021, 20, 22, 23. Uh, so, you know, that's down the road, but it's not that far down the road. The last time we had a levy um, for new money was back in 2012. You know, so our goal to make that last as long as we could um, continues to be something we want to focus on. Um, and then finally, she says, keep in mind that assumptions are estimates based on the best information it is possible to have. Um, and uh, so, so Judy did a really nice job of uh, pre preparing that for you to take a look at. I'm not sure that I may be the best guy to answer your questions related to that, but if you have a question, feel free to shoot in my direction. Well, and she was good about sending an email out yes. asking for comments, and I did have a couple questions, and she responded, so that was helpful. So. Good. 
We have a number of donations uh, to Twin Oak Elementary from CenturyLink, $30, to Columbia Elementary from Janine Davenport, uh, 14 books, uh, to Wigan Street from Ariel uh, Smart Board, value $650. And to Dan Emmett Elementary, um, Dean and Valetta Goon for $51 for a trip to MBNU. We did have a memorial book that was established some time ago. Unfortunately, um, it's generally when someone would pass away. And so to the title, John Lincoln Webb, the Civil War Drummer Boy, in memory of Jack Whitmore. Uh, Deb Whitmore is our school, si our school social worker, uh, and she's donating that to Pleasant Street Elementary. So those donations for your consideration. And this was her father. Huh? Yes. Yes. Okay, I would entertain a motion to approve those items as just read. I'll Thank you, Ms. Rodai. Motion. Motion. A second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Rodai. Were there any questions? Would you call the roll, please? Yes. Mrs. Beasel? Yes. Mrs. Regola Dye? Yes. Mr. Thompson? Yes. Getsman, yes, and Dr. Bennett. Yes, motion carried. Thank, Thank you. you. And legislative liaison report. Thank you. I have just a very brief report. There was no uh, link to uh, uh, this information this time. Uh, recently introduced uh, legislation, House Bill uh, 734, is uh, regarding breakfast programs at public schools. HB 738. Uh, would require 25% of the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission's budget be allocated to ensure all school buildings meet acceptable standards for air conditioning, accessibility, and school safety, and to require a study of the status of school buildings regarding air conditioning, accessibility, and school safety and other amenities. Senate Bill 329 is to revise the definition of hazing and to increase the penalty for a hazing offense to a first degree misdemeanor. SB 330 is to require public schools to include mental health in their curriculum and to require the State Board of Education to adopt standards for mental health education and to provide grant funding to districts for this curriculum. And that's all I have for for tonight. Is any questions or? What was the second one after House Bill 734? 738 was the Ohio uh, Facilities Commission. Right, okay, I, I know what it was. I just didn't get the number. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we have some items for approval. We do have a number of items for your approval. First is our free facility requests, and you can read those as you go down through. Uh, again, we want to always be mindful that, that we have community assets here and we want to be able to have our kids have access to those. Um, a proposal with Julian Drew to provide costs for reporting information for audits for that Medicare program we talked about earlier. And then item number four is the approval to authorize the superintendent and treasurer to secure the financing for the Education Gateway Project. Okay. And I think there are only three items. Yeah, it looks like the numbering got mixed up there. Okay. All righty. I would entertain a motion then to approve those three items as read. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Mrs. Getzman. Were there any questions? Would you call the roll, please? Mr. Thompson? Yes. Mrs. Getzman, yes. Mrs. Fiesel? Yes. Mrs. Regola Dye? Yes. And Dr. Bennett? Yes. Motion carried. And I believe there are no student services items. Okay, and personnel. Okay, uh, under personnel, we do have an item for information, revised contract for a co-curricular position. Um, uh, Jeff Gottke is uh, moving from his full-time status as a debate uh, pub advisor, so we're kind of shifting some folks around, and uh, Glenn and Sarah will do an excellent job. You'll notice that that doesn't equal two, it equals one and a half. And so uh, Jeff is going to stay on and he's going to help assist even though he'll be in another job in another capacity. So I wanted to share that item for information. Uh, we have a number of items recommended for board approval. Um, unfortunately there we do have a resignation of Jeff Gaki. Um, we also have a uh, resignation of swim coach and middle school girls basketball. Um, we're rescinding a contract uh, for an assistant girls soccer coach. And then in item three, we have employment of a number of supplemental uh, substitute uh, teachers. Uh, we did find ourselves um, having to hire a uh, 
uh, another intervention specialist because of our numbers. And so you'll see that she's uh, listed there, Denise Randall. And then we have parent volunteers and extracurricular folks. So those items for your approval. Okay, I would entertain a motion then for those three items as read. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Rilla. Do I have a second? I'll second Thank it. Thank you, Mrs. Fiesel. And were there any questions? I just have a comment. Um, I'd like to congratulate uh, Mr. Gottke on his uh, new ventures in life. And I'm sure he will be missed uh, by his colleagues and his students. May I ask a question? Um, Jeff is going to be part time then, as far as debate. Yes. Half time. Half -time. Half -time. So, does a current contract state full time? Do we have to rescind anything? We, we have two. We have uh, two full time equivalents because our debate team is is as large as it is, okay. and so three of those folks who were listed, um, we're doing it together. They're just changing the bits and parts, and that's why you see a rescinding of the contract. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Would you call the roll, please? Yes, Mrs. Regola Dye. Yes, Mrs. Fiesel. Yes, Mr. Thompson. Yes, Mrs. Getzman. Yes, and Dr. Bennett. Yes, motion carried. Thank, thank you. you. And classified staff. We have no items for information at this time. We do have a couple items for board approval. Um, uh, first is a uh, three and three quarter hour cook at the middle school, and we also have a substitute employment for uh, an aide and a secretary. Those two items for your consideration. Thank you. We're going to entertain a motion then to approve those two items. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Guladai. Were there any questions? Would you call the roll, please? Yes. Mr. Thompson? Yes. Mrs. Regola Dye? Yes. Mrs. Fiesel? Yes. Mrs. Getzman? Yes. And Dr. Bennett? Yes. Motion carried. And I don't believe we need executive. I don't have any executive session items unless the board has uh, anything they'd like to discuss. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. And do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. And we call the roll. Uh, Mrs. Regola Dye? Yes. Mr. Thompson? Yes. Mrs. Fiesel? Yes. Mrs. Getzman? Yes. And Dr. Bennett? Yes. Motion carried. We are adjourned. We're Thank going to be taking a tour of the facilities. You're welcome to join us. Thank you all for coming. Yes. Thank you for coming.